A Well with a Story to Tell 1. One of the basic human requirements is the need to dwell, and one of the central human acts is the act of inhabiting, of connecting ourselves, however temporarily, with a place on the planet which belongs to us and to which we belong. For me, this particular place is Camberwell in South London, England. Throughout my life, I've experienced numerous events that happened in this part of the city, yet there are a few that really stand out. I would like to tell you all of them, but as it's 3,000 years worth of history, I will have to narrow it down by getting on the important bits. Anyhow, let me start by telling you about the day John Chapel first encountered former midwife Noreen Moran. 2. It was spring, 2008, a sunny afternoon which lent itself perfectly to gardening. Or so thought Noreen. What a delightful day it is, Noreen said as she stepped outside. A neighbour of Noreen's happened to walk past her garden fence at that very moment and caught her words. It was John Chapel. They exchanged hellos, this being the first time they had properly met, and John struck up a conversation concerning a map he had recently found. John, being a hobby archaeologist, claimed this old survey map from the 1700s indicated a little red dot right in the middle of Noreen's garden. Both were intrigued, but little did they know what ancient history this red mark would lead them to. Funny as it may seem, and despite not knowing anything for sure, they felt like it was something worth investigating, and so they agreed to take on this project together. A period of two years followed this event, a period in which many hours of digging and much frustration produced no possible prospect of ever finding anything other than worms and dirt. Just as the frustration was becoming too much, and John was on the verge of giving up, Noreen made a fascinating discovery, indicating to John a spot in the garden in which the moss grew differently. It wasn't green as it would normally be. Instead, it was dark green, yes, almost black in colour. This phenomenon, they thought, was very suspicious. John suggested that it could hint at some kind of underground water source, which had to be investigated. So they kept digging, and digging, and digging, until one day, while Noreen was inside boiling water for tea, she heard a loud scream from outside her back door. Eon! She rushed out that he had hurt himself, but when she found him, he was standing six feet below ground in his ditch, chest raised, smile reaching from ear to ear, proudly announcing, I found it, Noreen. I found the well. Four. There it was, the well of Camberwell, an old companion of mine with an ancient story, a story of almost as old as my own. To tell you about the well, I have to start about 3,000 years ago, way before the Middle Ages, and even before the Romans came to England. So far back, in fact, that most of my memories from then have become very foggy. But what I will never forget is the day when the first outlander came to England. Brutus of Troy, the legendary descendant of the Trojan hero Aeneas, conquered this little green island and would soon become its king, the first king of Britain. By his wife, Brutus had three sons called Locrinus, Albanactus, and Camber. The third son, Camber, is who our story concerns. An amiable young man who fixed upon a delightful spot south of the Thames in which to make his vill, which would soon be known as Camberville. Nobody quite understood why the prince was so delighted by a place that was mostly marsh and quite impossible to build anything substantial upon. However, to him a certain appeal was brought about the raised mount. 
From it flowed a small river straight down to where the marshes started, the deepest spot in the village, known today as Camwell Leisure Centre. The river has now been drained for many years, but you can still see its remaining traces on the road. If you crouch down low enough and look at any street parallel to the river, like Peckham High Street, for example, you will see bulges in places where the river would have flowed. Campbell was fascinated by the many springs coming down from the top of the mountains which sourced the river, and would spend hours following their various streams. He had fallen dearly in love with his new home and wished he could stay there in peace. However, soon he would have to leave to face the oncoming battle against the Roman Empire, from which he knew he may never return. He decided to build a well in his name, so that long after he'd be gone, he would be remembered as the prince who gave this town its name, Campbell Well. 6. As predicted, soon after that, the Romans announced their plans to overtake the whole of Britain. Heavily armed, they marched further and further south towards where the Britons were waiting. Their paths had been chosen wisely so as to safely cross the marshy lowlands. The shortest and safest route linking the city centre with what is now South London was towards Camberwell, it being the nearest high ground to the south of this early London. That same path indeed still exists today and is now commonly known as the Camberwell Road. The road stretches from Elephant and Castle to Denmark Hill, around where the Grand Battle took place. Despite being much larger, the British army was defeated by the much better Roman soldiers. Thousands of Britons were lost in the fight, and soon after that Brutus's Britannia was turned into a Roman province which lasted for another 350 years after that. Remains of the old road can still be found just on the corner of Camberwell Green on Ballast Row behind the Nollywood pub, where a worn concrete path reveals the old hand-laid stone. Camber returned from his battle, wounded and stricken, and wandered straight to his well to drink from its waters. He was healed almost overnight, and from then on more and more people trekked from all over the place to drink from the notorious well that could heal. Soon the holy waters of Camberwell were widely known and attracted people from all over. It is no coincidence that in 1089 AD, after the discovery of the well's healing powers, the original St. Giles Church was built, that saint being the patron of the disabled. I remember thinking when they first built the church out of wood that it wouldn't last long, which is why it came as no surprise to me when in 1841 a young boy set fire to the church after having sneaked into the parish's secret wine supplies and as a consequence of being tripped with a candle in his hand. The heat was so great the stained glass melted and stone crumbled into powder. On the bright side, only three years later, the church was rebuilt into its current glory, which we still admire to this day. From where I sit, about half a mile south, I've got quite a striking view onto the church. I remember a couple of centuries ago, a certain mister, I've unfortunately forgotten the name of, was leaning against my trunk, rhyming a nursery, which he would later call Oranges and Lemons. He walked around desperately trying to find words to rhyme with bricks and tiles. That was until his eyes met St. Giles. 8. For many years the Roman well was left in its original state until the great Dr. John Oakley Letson came along. A famous physician, botanist, Quaker and philanthropist who had acquired a large strip of land in 1979. Letson had a villa on Grove Hill, with grounds extending to Camwell Grove. He used to sign his prescriptions, I Letson, and his signature occasioned the following epigram. When any patient calls an eye, I physics, bleeds and sweats him. If after that they choose to die, why, what cares I? I Letson. 
Let's entertain many famous people of his day. His house was much praised by his contemporaries, and no guidebook of the time was complete without an exhaustive description of it. The view from it was magnificent, but particularly towards London. In modern London, such views as I remember from the old days are much harder to come by, but not impossible if you know where to stand. If you go up Grove Park, along the service road, until you find number 115 Adelaide House, you can still witness one such view. It is best to go in the winter, after the leaves have all fallen from the trees. Letson was very aware of the well's exceptionality. He used its healing powers for his patients, and soon developed it into a large brick water conduit to supply all the houses on his property, and even beyond. Dr. Letson was responsible for many grand projects, like the building of his estate, and the community gardens from which the well and I were part of for many years. Never had it been greener and more joyful for us. We found ourselves in the company of happy families and individuals every day, and you could say we were at the peak of our lives then, the well and I. The man at the front gate is Old Scriven, the lodge keeper of Grove Park. 10. A few years after Dr. Letson's death, his properties were sold, and in 1893 the area became due for redevelopment to provide room for the growing population of London. My dear friend the well was filled in and would soon be buried far under the foundations of somebody's house. The well had provided water for thousands of people for thousands of years, and I could hardly bear to see its ancient history fall into oblivion. 12. What I saw that day, and what Noreen saw when she came rushing out of the house, was a row of bricks coming out from the mud just below John's feet. There it was, my friend, the famous well of Camberwell, hidden away for more than a 150 years after having fallen into disuse. It finally encountered the light of sun again. To this day, the Camberwell is still only partly uncovered, still sitting in Noreen's back garden. He can't be dug out all the way, as he is now partly under two houses and a pathway, but what counts is that its great story is finally brought back to life. More and more people will now know of the great story from which Camber Well takes its name, and perhaps occasionally think of old Camber when they speak of here. 14. Throughout the years, since being a little sapling on a nameless hill in between miles,